Good morning, everyone. So in your bulletin, there is an insert. It's our outline for today's message. We are in a series on prayer. And we're going to talk about how to pray to a God who lives beyond our four-dimensional world. You could say maybe he lives in the fifth dimension. For some of you who have been around a while, and I don't want to use the terms old or mature, because mature is just a euphemism for you're really, really, really old, but we don't want to say it, so we'll say mature. But for those of you who have been around, those of you who have been around a while, and maybe some others who just happen to like old songs, you may remember a group called The Fifth Dimension. It was made up of four members, primarily Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. And they married in 1969, and guess what? This year they are celebrating 49 years of marriage, which is incredible for Hollywood entertainers, right? That's kind of unusual. And you don't hear a lot about them. Occasionally they're interviewed on like the Christian Broadcasting Network because uh, they talk a lot about how their faith has made a difference in their marriage and you know secular networks aren't going to be too interested in that but they had some of the biggest hits in the late 60s and the early 1970s up up and away wedding bell blues aquarius let the sun shine in one less bell tank one less bell to answer one less egg to fry one less man to pick up after all right well anyway thank you. that's the fifth dimension in popular culture and the only reason why i mention them is because you can't use the phrase the fifth dimension without thinking about the singing group so I've mentioned the singing group, and so we're going to put them over here because they have nothing to do with today's message. <laughs> there is actually a scientific discussion about the existence of a fifth dimension. Swedish physicist Oscar Klein says it's, quote, a dimension unseen by humans where forces of gravity and electromagnetism unite to create fundamental forces end quote. Now I don't understand any of that, but here's the point of the scientific aspect of the fifth dimension. It's not directly observable. Just remember, it's not directly observable. Generally, it is believed we live in a four-dimensional world. Length, breadth, depth, height, some say time. All of these are measurable. You can measure length and breadth and depth and height and time, but prayer is multi-dimensional. That is, there are some aspects of prayer that, like the fifth dimension, can't be seen or measured. So we need to be reminded of a fundamental fact about God because our understanding of God is the basis of prayer and the more we know about God the more effective and meaningful our prayer life is going to be so here's the fundamental fact about God we need to know God is multi-dimensional God is not like this sheet of paper that has one angle or we could say one dimension we could say this paper is one Dimensional. But God is not like that. He exists in a dimension that is beyond our ability to see and our ability to measure. Now, God has some qualities that we can see and other qualities which we can't see. So, number one on your outline God's multi dimensional nature is seen in creation. His multi-dimensional nature is seen in creation. This is Romans 1.20. It says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal
eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. So from nature, we can physically observe that God loves variety, obviously, right? Loves variety, look around the world, look around this room. We know that God is organized. We know that God is powerful. But we also know that there are dimensions to God that like the fifth dimension can't be measured because they're not directly observable. So number two, God's multidimensional nature is seen in Jesus' incarnation. Incarnation is the religious word or a, the theological word meaning God came to earth as a man. He came from heaven to earth. So in John 1.14, it says, The Word became a human and lived among us. We saw His glory, the glory that belongs to the Father. The fact that a non-physical God can come to earth as a physical human being means there are dimensions to God that we do not fully understand. That's why Paul, in 1 Timothy 3, talked about the incarnation, and he called it a mystery of godliness. In Revelation 1.4, it says this, Grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come. Oh, I forgot to give you the point. God's multidimensional nature is seen in His eternal existence. That's number three. His multidimensional nature is seen as it in His eternal existence. It says this in Revelation 1.4. Grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come. So what this says is that God is not bound by the limits of space or time. He's not bound by physical dimensions like we are. He is multi-dimensional. And then number four, God's multi-dimensional nature is seen in the actions of the Holy Spirit. His multi-dimensional nature is seen in the actions of the Holy Spirit. This is John 3, 8. It says the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you don't know where the wind comes from or where it's going. That's for sure. Wind blows wherever it wants. If I can personify Hurricane Michael, he went where he wanted to go, he did what he wanted to do, and nobody could do anything about it. Why? Because the wind blows wherever it pleases and there are mysteries even in the weather phenomenon that we know as a hurricane as there are in the Holy Spirit. It says that's the way it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And so you can't measure the Holy Spirit. Spirit is beyond us. You can't. You can't put the Holy Spirit in this box. We can't put the Spirit in this box and we can't get out of tape measure and say we are now going to measure the Holy Spirit. And that's what I'm going to do. Okay, because you know the Holy Spirit and I've pushed the Holy Spirit down in this box. The Holy Spirit is 14 inches long and about 8 inches wide and about... Eight inches high, and apparently has something to do with Amazon Prime. <laughs> we can't do that. Because the Spirit lives in a dimension that is beyond human understanding. Okay, so on a practical... That, that was some pretty heavy theology, right? So on a practical level, what does all this mean? What does the multidimensional nature of God mean to me on a day-by-day -day basis? It means this, you are never alone. That's what it means. You are never alone. God is in the past, He is in the present, and He is in your future. 
God is under you. He is over you. He is around you. And get this, He is even in you. So in Psalm 139, a few rhetorical questions are asked. Where could I go to escape you? Where could I get away from your presence? Well, if I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I lay down in the world of the dead, you would be there. If I flew away beyond the east or lived in the farthest place in the west, you would be there to lead me. You would be there to help me. There's no place where you've been or are going that God hasn't already been there. And that should encourage you. God is already in your future. You are never alone. Now you may be thinking, what does this have to do with prayer? It has everything to do with prayer. Since God is everywhere, He sees everything, He understands everything, and He knows everything. And so we can pray to a God understanding and knowing that there's nothing that surprises Him. He knows about Google. He knows about Twitter. He knows about Facebook. He knows about Instagram. He knows about Spotify. He knows about Snapchat. And he even knows about Candy Crush. <laughs> knows everything. So here's the application. Because God is in every dimension, four dimensions, five dimensions, dimensions we don't know about, there are five ways or five dimensions we can pray in. So we're going to look at some of these. We're going to call them prayer dimensions. So prayer dimension number one is when I pray, I look back at the cross and thank God. When I pray, I look back at the cross and thank God. So when you start a prayer, and I'm not really talking about your, your quick prayers during the day, like, Lord, help me get through this meeting, right? Lord, help me deal with this person or handle this situation. Sometimes we have rather quick prayers. This would maybe during your regular prayer time. When you start your prayer, don't start with your problems today or your fear of tomorrow. Start with what you are grateful for in the past. Thank God for the cross because it fills you with thanksgiving and gives you an attitude of gratitude. So in 1 Peter 1.18 it says, For you know, here's what you know, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you. And the ransom He paid was not mere gold or silver. He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless, spotless Lamb of God. So a good way to start prayer is reminding yourself of the cross and how much God loves you. So before you get into, well, these are my needs for today, these are my fears today, these are my worries today, be thankful for what God has done for you. And I think I put this on your outline, I wasn't going to mention them, but I think they're on the outline, so... The cross instantly reminds me of three things. Number one, how deeply God loves me. Number two, the costly price of sin. And three, how completely forgiven I am. So thank God. And then prayer dimension number two. When I pray, I look up into God's presence and see Him as my Father. When I pray, I look up into God's presence and see Him as my Father. God does not want you to see Him as a dictator. Doesn't want you to see Him as a supervisor. Doesn't want you to see Him as a coach. He wants you to see Him as a Father. And this is a radical concept. Because to my knowledge, people in the Old Testament did not call God Father. So do you call God Father? Father in your prayers. Now someone might say, well, no, I don't because I did not have a very good earthly father. And we can understand where a person is coming from who makes that statement. But remember that your physical dad is not your heavenly father who is always caring, always
always close, always considerate, and always capable. And the way you see God and address God in prayer will control your life more than anything else. And remember, when you come before God in prayer, you are not giving a deposition to an attorney. Some people think that they're before, you know, they're in front of an attorney. You are not giving a lie detector test to the FBI. When you, the people come before God and they think they're getting some kind of a lie detector test, they got electrodes on them. And what's your name? Da Bruce is my name. That's not how God wants you to feel when you come before him. Look at Romans 8, 15. You should not be like cowering, fearful slaves. You should behave instead like God's very own children adopted into his family, crying out, Abba, Father. For his Holy Spirit speaks to us deep in our hearts and tells us that we are God's children. This is a life changing passage. Abba, Father, stresses family relationship. And remember in prayer, you are not talking to a stranger. So three things from this passage in Romans. Number one, God wants my prayers to be personal. He wants my prayers to be personal. Abba, Father. Abba was the casual term in the Aramaic language for Daddy. In fact, it's still used in some parts of the world. You can go to some places in the Middle East and there'll be a kid out on the street and he'll see his dad and he'll run. Abba, 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 Abba. They do. I know that. It's true. It's true. God wants your prayers to be simple and Christ like. And then number two is he wants our prayers to be passionate. He wants our prayers to be passionate. Look at this. We cry out, Abba, Father. It's not Abba, Father. It's Abba, Father. Have you noticed how kids will cry out and they don't care where they are? Has anyone noticed that other than me? Yeah, every parent knows that. They'll cry out in a restaurant. They'll cry out in a funeral. They'll cry out in church. And so I want to ask are you that way in prayer? Put a little oomph into your prayers. You're not meeting with your tax preparer. Now sometimes we pray and we think we're meeting with our tax preparer and we're trying to give an account of why we want that $500 deducted from the 1040 form. This is God. This is not your CPA. And then three, God wants my prayers to be a partnership. He wants my prayers to be a partnership. It's a partnership by His Spirit. Look at this interesting passage in Romans 8, 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress. Well, that's, that's good. For we don't even know what we should pray for, nor how we should pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. What does this mean? God knows that oftentimes when we come before Him, we're just not exactly sure what to say. You know, sometimes a child can't quite explain to you exactly what, what they want, but you know exactly what they want because you are their parent. And there are times you come before the Lord, there's something on you, it's emotional, you don't know what to say, you don't even have any words to say. How can you have any words if you're dealing with a relationship issue or a financial issue or a health issue? How do you even... Come before the Lord with those things. Sometimes it's so deep and so distressful. The Holy Spirit intercedes for you. That's the beautiful thing. And because God is multidimensional and knows all things, He knows what's in our heart, and He can take it right up to the top. And then prayer dimension number three is when I pray, pray, I look inward to Jesus living in me. I look inward to Jesus living in me. When you were baptized and became a Christian, God put His Spirit in you. In fact, the Trinity lives in you. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Somebody put it this way, all three in me. Jesus living in me and in you is a dimension we don't fully understand and we don't always feel it, right? But because I know He lives in me, and you know He lives in you, it gives me confidence, it should give all of us confidence, that we can honestly face our faults and ask Him to help us to get rid of stuff that He doesn't like. Secret sins and fear and resentment. This is 2 Corinthians 13.5. It says examine yourselves to see whether you are living in faith. Test yourself. If you cannot tell that Christ is in you, it means you have failed the test. Before we can do better, we need to examine ourselves based on the standard of God's Word. And I agree with what Jesus said. Of course, it's a good thing to agree with what Jesus said, right? I agree with his statement, the truth will set you free. I, I totally agree, but I'm here to tell you, usually the truth will first make you miserable before it sets you free. Because the truth you like the least is the truth you need the most. That's my quotable quote for the day. The truth we like the least, that's the truth we need the most. So as you pray, look inward to Jesus living in you, and ask Him to help you do a little bit of house cleaning and get some of the junk out of your life. And we can start by practicing the fruit of the Spirit. So here's, here's a good way to start. This is Galatians 5, 22. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, He will produce this kind of fruit in us. And fruit is in the singular. It's not fruits, plural. There's one fruit manifested in different ways. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here, there is no conflict with the law. And so, when I pray, I look to Jesus living in me. And then number four, this is prayer dimension number four. When I pray, I look around and ask the Holy Spirit to use me. I look around and ask the Holy Spirit to use me. One of the most dangerous prayers you can pray is just two words, use me. That's the fourth dimension of prayer. This is Romans 6, verse 13. Do not let any part of your bodies become tools of wickedness to be used for sinning, but give yourselves completely to God. Notice, you're making the decision. It is your will, your volition. God isn't holding you back from making this decision. Every part of you, for you are back from death, and you want to be tools in the hands of God to be used for His good purposes. And so the fourth dimension of prayer is, Lord, use me in the way that you want to use me. Now, you don't have to be thinking of anything great. A lot of times when we say, we pray and say, Lord, use me, we think, oh yeah, use me, and I want to be in 52 countries over the next 52 weeks. We think it has to be some big, grand, glorious journey in order for God to bless it, but that's not true. Just keep doing the normal stuff that you're doing, but do it with a lot of love and God will bless it and start with the people who are closest to you. And then number five, this is prayer dimension number five. When I pray, I look ahead to my future which is rooted in faith. When I pray, I look ahead to my future which is rooted in faith. This is when you talk to God about your schedule today and tomorrow and the next 10 years. God wants to hear your plans and your thoughts and your ideas and your dreams just as any parent loves to hear their children talk about their dreams, right? Parents, oh, those are beautiful dreams that you have. So you can pray and say something like, Father, 
Help me prioritize today. Show me what matters most. Give me the energy to keep going. Help me to have tough skin and a tender heart and especially to be flexible when my plans are interrupted. And would you remember that you have a foolproof manual to guide you and encourage you. And the more you understand biblical principles, the more confident you're going to be in your eternal salvation and your ability to handle day-by-day -day situations in life. Look at Philippians 1.6. It says, I am confident of this, that God who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Right. So whatever God has started in you, small or big, He's going to carry it out until it's completed because God doesn't sponsor flops. And you're going to be a spiritual success. You are a spiritual success. You're going to continue to be a spiritual success. Now, whether you're going to make it to CEO or not, I don't know. I'll be praying for you to get there because if you get there, then Port City is going to be in a lot better shape. So I'm praying for all of you to be CEO and have uh, $10 million. Beautiful. I'm all for it. I don't think that you've been promised $10 million, but I'm beautiful if it happens, right? But what God is promising that if you will pray to Him, be sincere and dedicated in your faith, he will give you whatever inner strength you need to keep going and, and never give up on your faith. And that's the important thing. From an eternal perspective. Now, we get a few of these little extras along the way. Ah, that will be nice too. We All we want is just a few bucks to be able to go to Dairy Queen every now and then. Yeah, yeah, that was amen on the Dairy Queen. Yeah, all right. So Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for you. The question is this. Will you accept it and be baptized? So I put this prayer in the, in your, on your outline. It's, it's not really necessarily a prayer for everybody, but I, so I, was, I debated whether to put it on the outline or not. But I said, yeah, I'll just put it on the outline. But here's a prayer you could pray. I prayed this prayer when I was 19, and I was at a Church of Christ had gone to other religious groups. Seemed like this group was focused on the Bible, and I like that. And so I prayed a prayer like this. I said, Lord, I don't understand everything, but as much as I know how, I surrender to you, beginning with the action of baptism. I want to live the kind of life made possible by you. My past sins forgiven, my purpose for living clear, and my pathway to heaven secure. I throw myself on your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So a long time ago, in the book of Acts chapter 2, there was a Jewish feast called Pentecost, and many people had assembled in Jerusalem, maybe 100,000. There were a lot of people. And Peter, along with the other apostles, stood before the crowd, and they essentially said to this group of Jewish people that you are responsible at the hands of the Romans of putting to death Christ, the Messiah, the one who is to come and save the nation. So they asked, and said, so what are we supposed to do about it? And this was Peter's response. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if anywhere where it's clear, more defined, or simpler than right here. I'm aware that there are other passages that talk about other things related to salvation, but this is one passage that at some point in time we need to look at it and seriously ask ourselves, what am I going to do in the light of God's clearly revealed word? So keep prayer as an important part of your life. And I'm going to ask you to stand as David leads us in the invitation hymn. And if you have a particular need, let us know what it is while we stand and sing.